show you some. The National Instruments Limited factory is, was, is located right across my campus in Calcutta, southern part of Calcutta. It started off uh, as a small unit called the Mathematical Instrument Maker in 1830 in Calcutta. And it was basically servicing instruments for the uh, Surveyor General of India at that time under the East India Company and under the sort of supervision of George Everest who kindly lent his name to the highest peak uh, in, the, in the world, even though it was his subordinates who did the survey for him. Uh, the, the it became Mathematical Instruments Office and then National Instruments and then after independence was uh, relaunched as a public sector undertaking in 1957, loca relocated in the Jadavpur area where my university is and was called National Instruments Limited. This is from 1957. It used to produce, I mean, so it kind of uh, straddles these two moments, the initial moment of the beginning of the surveying census uh, activity in India, the rational scientific technological governmental project, and also the later moment of post-independence industrialism and modernization. So 1957 is right in the middle of the second five-year plan under the stewardship of Jawaharlal Nehru. And it it's used to manufacture all kinds of optical instruments. The first uh, indigenous SLR camera, National 35, for India was uh, made by them. Also four other models of the National 35 camera. But apart from that, for the uh, Army, it produced night vision binoculars. It produced uh, geological survey instruments like theodolites. And, uh, number of other uh, sort of uh, uh, precision instruments for measuring and image making. In the 19 late 80s, is, it began to f sort of uh, face all kinds of uh, crisis, financial crisis. Then by 1992, it was declared a kind of sick unit and was referred to the Board of Industrial and Financial Reconstruction. In 2003, it finally, I mean, at that time, it had about 2,000 uh, workers. It finally stopped manufacture, but it continued to sell its products and so on. In 2003 also, on uh, the 14th of March, a uh, bulk of the employees were given the VRS option, the Voluntary Retirement Scheme option by the government. And 503 of, three of them decided to take it, 64 of them, the last 64 remaining stayed put, and the uh, factory began to wear this kind of desolate look after that. In 2009, Jadapur University, this is for the first time this is happening in India, took over the campus with the 64 employees and decided to turn it into a new extension campus. So we got access to the premises. So when we went in, <laughs> Uh, it was something that uh, is not, eas not uh, easy to forget. There was everything, the tools, the objects, the you know, files, the papers, the furniture, the products, the personal effects of the workers, their overalls, their shirts, their personal letters, their photographs, coins, images, icons that they worshipped, and so on and so forth. A teeming desolation, you may like to call it, but no people. Everything was there, the clocks that had stopped, the punch cards, everything, the keys hanging from the boards, but no people. Anushtu Basu, a young uh, scholar who I admire very much, has recently written on that, uh, on the archive that we created later. This is going to be published, it's an unpublished essay, where he asks an interesting question to the ar archive itself, the photographs and video that we created, and I'll, I'll show you a sample of that. Is there an image in the archive, he asks. Now, the point is, I think one way to respond to his question is that the factory as we found it was already an image of some, some kind. An image of what was not there. Something that had stopped, people that have, that have just stood up and left, as it were. So it was already a trace, in that sense an image that holds back, holds its tongue, that holds back something. Rancière has recently, very interestingly, defined the image in, the, in, in those terms, uh, which holds its tongue, that sense. But sort of this ephemera 
uh, the collection of the sort of these objects also give us a sense from the very beginning that it was already infused with some kind of a potential of the image. So I think that's the contemporary kind of perception of relationship that we build with the ephemera. We collect those things primarily, not entirely, but primarily, which are already sort of images in some sense. So already kind of you know, infused with the possibility of an image. So what we did, what we created out of that was an image of an image, or that was a task one set oneself, that is to say. Because images are not really pictures and sounds only. They have to become uh, images. So we asked 10 young artists and photographers and cinematographers to work for about six months on the premises and to create a collection of two, photograph everything, both photograph and videograph. So now there are about 20,000 odd stills, digital stills and also some analog uh, sort of images. About 65 hours of video, including interviews of ex-workers, wherever we could get hold of them and sound recordings and so on. I'll show you a quick sample of, but these are not the best images, unfortunately. I was not really carrying them with me. This is a, uh, the, sorry. This is what we saw as we entered the premises. This uh, model for an exhibition that they put up. This camera was yet to come out. They were trying to sort of build this uh, SLR camera. Uh, this is the image of, this is kind of uh, in Bengali and in English, written on one of the machines in the main machine shop. Where it says the historic VRS day, 14303, 2003, when these 503 people took the voluntary retirement were more or less left with no other option. So they left. So somebody, before leaving the place, had written this with a chalk on a machine. This is the main uh, workshop. Can I, uh, can I switch off the lights, maybe? Is it possible? Because these are not very good resolutions, so maybe Or we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. This is their canteen where they used to project battleship Potemkin and stuff on the wall, they told us. This is a pension and salary section. So if you go to leave through the pages, you get uh, almost entire life histories of workers.
the Media Lab website, www.medialabju.org, has a factory tab where, unfortunately, you don't have too many still images because they're, we have to find out a way of uh, putting that bulk on line. But you have uh, four videos that young filmmakers have created out of our stills and video uh, kind of collection because we have been inviting people to come and sort of, you know, re-edit the footage or make installations. Somebody has done also a sound installation and uh, films are being made. Four of them are already online. You can take a look at that. If there was time I would have shown you a little bit of video, but I don't think I have that time. So, I mean, we were asking ourselves, why would, should we do this work? I mean, apart from the kind of extremely fascinating uh, uh, sort of character of the object, the area, the premises, uh, because the Media Lab and the Department of Film Studies, which, of which the Media Lab is a part at Jadapur, is was basically building a, a few digital databases on the ephemera or other documents, not only ephemera, related to the history of Indian cinema which is uh, sort of something that remains to be properly written. So we thought since there is an absence of comprehensive histories of Indian cinema, because it is divided into so many regions, languages, and so on, we should just start with themes and build and uh, collect whatever one could find around them. So uh, these digital databases, of course, had you know calendars, posters, the ephemeral life, everyday life of cinema. Uh, but we thought that you know this is part of a kind of the, if you like, the archiving the everyday project, and we could actually extend our work in the media lab into the factory in that sense, in the sense that the images do kind of saturate our everyday environments in a certain way. It's semiotically saturated in our contemporary times, in a particular way, and uh, 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 kind of you know it's like if you are really capturing surfaces, textures objects that, that lie about in sort of, you know, uh, the surrounding neighborhood or the landscape, uh, one would, one can also sort of, you know, take one step ahead and get into these factory premises, uh, this premises like this National Instruments Factory. And within the National Instruments Factory, of course, we saw a lot of images. They would have these film posters, they would have these, uh, you know, various kinds of things related to cinema and so on, and sports, cinema. And uh, uh, more than that, you, you, could, you could get some sense, I think, of uh, this uh, kind of spectacle where lenses, uh, photometers, and aperture, I mean, sort of cameras, sometimes uh, in their ruins, actually stare out of the place. So that it's, it's in that sense the classic uncanny, where the picture looks back at you. There's also this kind of you know, surrounding surface, which is uh, a common experience in our times, I suppose, where things look back at you. Things which should not have eyes have some kind of a gaze, as uh, psychoanalysis sometimes calls it. Not the look, but the gaze. So a kind of you know, punctum of the camera within the image. So if you were as landscape here, a neighborhood, the, the, but the question was, the question that is related to, related to the one about how to turn it into an image, this image of an, how to create an image of an image, the factory itself was already some sort of an image having absorbed this kind of energy of visuality, how to create an image of an image. But also, I mean, the related question is, can what you, know, what you create speak of the transformation of the landscape and the attendant violence? Because if you think of this land area, it's the area where the refugees, in the wake of the partition of India in 1947, then 1971 Bangladesh war, uh, kind of waves of uh, influx, refugee influx took place. They came and settled around this area. In the initial phase, actually forcibly sort of you know, squatting, occupying the land, in any case a fallow land. And interestingly, in the 1950s, slowly what you see is refugee colonies coming up. But at the same time, a, a number of scientific technological establishments, research schools coming up and institutions, and Jadhapur University itself, which is a new university, which actually was uh, founded in 1955, 
before that, that there was this nationalist project called the uh, uh, the uh, National Council of Education (NCE), related connected with the nationalist movement, but it, it kind of evolved into the university later. So what you had was basically the scientific in, in, uh, institutions, the university, the refugee settlement, and the factories. National Instruments is one of them, but there were several factories around the place. Most of them, almost all of them, have closed out. And all of them have been turned into, except one, which is still disputed, have, have been quickly turned into high-rise uh, gated communities. So that's the violence one is talking about. National instruments being a public sector undertaking and also being taken over by the university could not be immediately turned into a shopping mall and a uh, kind of you know, connected housing complex, probably to the you know, disappoint, great disappointment of what we call promoters. You know, this is a, uh, a very common term to come by, promoters, the land sharks and realtors. So uh, it's, it's possible probably to think of the of a history of the neighborhood through the factory, through its ephemera, but it's, of course, as you know, this is not the kind of history that usually historians write. Well, things often, this is a much cited article now, it has been dug up, Secret Krakow is uh, on photography, 1927, where he complains about this excessive documentation in the photographic age. Of course, he hadn't seen the digital age. So, <laughs> see, so, so this is a kind of, uh, he thinks it's an excessive historicism also. But there's another way of doing history here. For example, if I had time, I could also show you a little bit, but you can look them up yourself on the net. The moment we put up some of these photographs in the form of a blog, uh, some people started uh, sort of, you know, accessing it, and it got connected, hyperlinked, to various other projects around the world. For example, Dark Room Project, where this photographer is going around sort of taking pictures of the dark rooms. Dark rooms are going out of uh, you know, use uh, because people are using digital technology. The Kodak Project, this uh, photographer and his friends who have been photographing the closed down Kodak factories because celluloid films are not in use anymore, not that much. Or the Polaroid Project, where the Polaroid factory, the a group of people have been trying to revive it and so on. Or more classically, the Berndt and Hilda Becker, that, you know, those post-war kind of a German uh, couple who memorably photographed all these old abandoned uh, sort of water tanks and sort of machines. These are all there on the web. So we sort of, you know, the connections were building up on the web as we put up the photographs there in the form of a blog. Team Edensor's uh, project called the Industrial Ruins on Manchester and Sheffield kind of closed factories and so on. So we thought that was another kind of lateral connection that was building up, which speaks of, which slowly gives rise to both this image of the industrial ruin and in a non-narrative way, uh, also, you know, sort of proposes the form of a form of history, which is why we actually invited artists, young artists and photographers to work on it, because this is where the question of form becomes important, I think, uh, where actually, you know, something like a database form has to be reflected on, which is not like a narrative form. And as uh, Lev Manovich has, I think, uh, so famously made these distinctions, I think some of them are still valid that you know, in, in database forms, you have not only an open-endedness, which is of course something that everybody celebrates all the time, but uh, also this possibility of a paradigm coming to the surface. So what happens in a narrative is that the paradigmatic axis is the hidden axis. So possible choices are not really present before you. You make the choices, you create the narrative. But there are other ways of linking the same episodes and same incidents and same characters. Those other ways, as a set of choices, forms the paradigmatic axis, but it's virtual. The actual before you, in front of you, is this syntagmatic, the real connections that you see in a story or a narrative or a history or so on. In database, as a form, as an aesthetic form, the paradigmatic axis becomes actual, the syntagmatic becomes virtual. So that, that I think, distinction and a few others that Manovich made still makes, I think, uh, sense in this respect, in the sense that it is through a connected history 
and connections done with possibilities of connections la laid out before us, alternatives, that resistant memory of the ephemera, that, that of an image out of the ephemera could be created. So I think I should stop there because I think my time is over, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs>